So, yeah, hi everybody. Um, uh, at, at least sort of half of you, if not more, know me. So I always feel stupid telling you who I am. Um, but um, uh, since some of you out there don't know who I am, um, I um, am a partner in All About Writing and um, I have, I'm internationally published. I have um, five books. My first book is also my last book in a way, but I do, it's not one of the five. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the five, but I don't count it twice. But I'm uh, rather thrilled that it's recently been reissued 20 years after it appeared as a Picador Africa classic. So that was rather nice. I started my life as a journalist, spent some time as an academic, and along the way, picked up a PhD in creative writing. Um, uh, Roger, Chris, can you mute everybody? I must unmute myself. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, through all about writing, um, Richard and I teach and work with writers um, from novices right through to very experienced writers. Um, and it's always fascinating. It's always a wonderful thing to be doing. Um, I will, Richard is unable to join us. He's not well. Um, we will be joined by our associate, um, uh, Michelle Rowe, um, who is a screenwriter and story originator. Um, and she has also written two, uh, two crime novels and she's busy on her third. She runs screenwriting courses with Richard for us, for All About Writing and she will join us in just a little while. Um, oh, and the two of them, by the way, have just developed a brand new course called the Hero's Journey course, which is just as valuable for script and screenwriters as it is for writers of um, books and stories, short stories. Okay, so I'm going to head straight in then with, um, um, oh, what I wanted to say is that, as usual, um, you'll all be muted, but uh, because of the, the background noise that creates such absolute chaos, if, if we don't, as you noticed. But um, if you want to ask something or add a comment, um, I'll keep an eye on the, um, uh, on the chat and I, if something relates directly to a question that we're talking about, I will draw it into the discussion. If it's a different question, I will give precedence to the questions we re received beforehand and I'll try and keep a note of those and refer to them again at the end. Okay, so yeah, this is the, um, uh, as you know, the, we, this is where we answer your questions. We listen to your concerns and we try to um, deal with the issues that have been bothering you. So, um, okay, the first question that came in came from Anne. And she said, what can I do to get back into the freewheeling mindset I used to have pre-COVID, which allowed me to write poems? She says, I've tried all my usual tricks and habits, but none of them are working and the slate is as blank as an empty bowl. Um, it's different to writer's block. It is a sad emptiness that feels pretty existential. I've signed up for MOOCs and Zoom events and just seem to retreat further and further into my own shell. Perhaps it's just a time of waiting, but for what? So she says, grateful for any tips. So um, my, one of my first suggestions is always that um, brilliant old habit of um, 
free writing. I often find that it helps. Um, whether you do it in the form of morning pages, first thing in the morning, or just sit down with a notebook and try not to think about what you'll be writing about. In other words, there's no pressure. There's absolutely no sense of, I need to be writing about something. You just write whatever comes into your head. And as you write about, I mustn't forget to buy the milk on the way home and um, you know, I wonder what's going on out there, which is usually the first things that flit into your brain, write them down, carry on writing. And when you threw the lists and the concerns and the moans, you'll find that after a while you become a little bit meditative. You get into that slightly dream state where creative ideas seem to come to you. So that's, um, the, um, that's the point um, where your ideas start flowing. But I think the idea is not to put pressure on yourself because, uh, you know, the, as we say, this is a time that has been unlike any other. And it's a time that has put so many pressures on us that although we, want, we don't want to just give up on creativity and writing, but we want to somehow do it without laying on extra pressure. So um, I would also say, try not to focus so hard on exactly what you did before, because it creates an expectation and, and it piles on the pressure still more. So my suggestion, and this has worked for me in the past, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, try writing something completely different that you don't care quite so much about, perhaps. It might turn into something that you care about, but try and just write something for the sake of writing that you don't care about. Perhaps if you wrote serious poetry before, try writing something funny or light. Um, perhaps just describe an anecdote because then you don't have to have the pressure of trying to make something up. So perhaps think of an anecdote, something that you experienced um, in a queue or trying to go to the, to the supermarket with everybody in masks and, you know, interactions between people and try and D describe it in as much specific detail as you can. And uh, perhaps as well, so that, uh, you know, in doing that, uh, that's excellent writing practice, both for poetry and for prose. But, you know, the specifics of, of situations. Um, writing is all about the details. So if you focus on just trying to describe something in specific detail. You are writing, you are being creative, and it gets you back into the practice. And, um, and it means that you are not, um, you know, r putting that kind of pressure on you to write what you normally write. Perhaps also, turn the, if you can, to try and turn the melancholy on its head. So instead of seeing it as something that you're trying to overcome, try and focus on, try and focus on it. In other words, try and write about the melancholy, perhaps in a slightly self-deprecating way. Try to see the, the ridiculousness of it, the absurdity of it. And, um, you know, in uh, 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 the absurdity about the state we're in and the, the way we've all responded to it. Write about it. Pick out the details which show us all, you know, the, our sort of complete human absurdity. Um, and just try and, you know, because I think there's, there's also, it's difficult trying to... Um, uh, you know, overcome something. And we never can. It's like meditating and there's a lawnmower next door and you're trying to tune out the lawnmower and the bloody lawnmower won't shut up and you can't meditate. But if you focus on the lawnmower, 
sometimes then it works better. Your thoughts flow better or you meditate better. So perhaps turn it around in that way. And I told you I was going to give you some examples. So there have been points in my life where I've felt completely despairing and burnt out. And after my first book, which kind of did in its time, it sort of hit a lucky point and it did very, very well in its time. And I felt such a huge weight of expectation. Um, and I was struggling to produce my second book. And my, at that stage, my UK publishers were collaborating on a collection of short stories with Cosmopolitan. So it was a more fun collection of stories. Um, and um, I, I was asked as one of their stable of women writers, um, was asked to write a short story, a light and frothy short story. Um, so, but there were very strict guidelines. It had to have characters between the ages of 20 and 35. It had to fit the title, girls just want to have fun and so on and so on. So for some reason, the very tightness of those guidelines freed me to be creative in an odd way. The pressure of producing another book didn't affect me because this was different. It was, it wasn't the pressure, you know, the expectation was on my second book. It wasn't on this light, frothy, short story. And the creativity just flowed. And because of those guidelines, often if you've got very strict guidelines, it frees you up within those guidelines to be creative. And, um, um, yeah, after my fifth book, I felt a similar rather crushing block. And I know it sounds completely ridiculous, but I embarked on a PhD dissertation and I found it completely refreshing because somehow I didn't have the expectations and the, and, and the, um, the pressure of writing a novel. And it was such a different kind of writing that I enjoyed the research, I enjoyed the straightforward logic of creating an argument. It was different. So again, it caused me my ideas and thoughts to flow, but in a different direction. So yeah, there, those are my thoughts to, you know, take, basically take the pressure off with, you know, free writing, try and focus on it rather than away from it. Um, uh, you know, do something completely different. Um, or of course, take a writing course, which provides prompts for you to write to. And again, those strict guidelines can sometimes prompt um, quite a lot of creativity within those and that can get you into the writing discipline again and get you writing again and uh, just in case you think i'm trying to sell all our courses to you besides our comprehensive writing courses we do have a lot of free offerings which can um, keep you writing um okay i believe let me just have a quick look um here I see Fra uh, Frankie says um, she, uh, you know, she can start writing about emotions when trying to form a new character. And Kami says uh, one wants to write about three generations. Is it, oh, okay, this is a new question. All right, so let's wait for that, Kami, I'll come back to you. But in the meantime, I believe Mish has joined us. Mish, hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I had a bit of a blaps with the time, the British time and the South African time. I thought so. so I'm sorry. I completely misread my. Yeah, my, no um, problem. Mail. So but but I'm sorry I have you all waiting. <laughs> that's fine because I just launched into the first question and I did introduce you so they all that's know good. who you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, Joanne. And, and welcome to everybody on this um, particular webinar. I really look forward to meeting all of you and hearing your questions and so on. I just thought I'd jump in on the back of what Joanne had to say about, about Anne's question, because it's, um, 
has a particular personal resonance for me, your question, Anne. Uh, my son is completing a master's in poetry at the Seamus Heaney Center in Queen's University in, in Ireland. And for many months, he was locked down um, in an attic room through this entire cold winter. And I think he got terribly depressed. He was sharing with someone who couldn't speak English and she had high comorbidities. And he had to, de he had to deliver a folio of, of poems and he just didn't know how he was going to do it. He was so depressed and he was quite paralyzed actually. So he did something quite interesting. He had a tiny attic room with one window and he just decided to focus every day on what he could see out of that window, which was a tree with two pigeons in it. And he, through the tree, he could see across the road a window with a couple who lived in that, in that house. And so every day he just make little notes about what he could see out of the window. And he, then, he didn't try and write poetry. And at the end of that, he just looked through his notebook and he started editing it into verse. And he said it wasn't the best poems that he's ever written, but it sort of saved him and helped him to write again. And I suppose if I, he, he, the other bit of advice that I think he would give, because he often tells me this, is in, you don't have to write poetry. Poetry is a way of being. So you can read it. You can listen to podcasts. You can maybe read poets you've never read before. And just immerse yourself in this art that you love. And then one day you will just feel like writing again. I think it's been a very hard time being locked down and people's creativity has really suffered. Um, you know, we all think, oh, we will write books and we write poems and we'll do paintings. And I think most of us haven't done that. So I think just be kind to yourself and the poems will come back. Yep. I think that's great advice. Okay, Mish, do you want to read the next question? Um, okay. Um, oh. Oh, all sorts of strange things have happened here. <laughs> 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 okay, um, I'm answering a question which was sent in by Javanthi. I hope I've said your name correctly, Jayanthi Siva. And the question is, when working on nonfiction, setting things in historical perspective, but it's primarily a how-to professional skill-oriented writing, how to balance the research with its own wisdom and experience and how to decide enough when enough research is done. Um, there's two sides to these, uh, there's two questions here, but I'm just going to answer the first one, Jantha, and if we have time, I'll get around to the second one afterwards. So, um, how little or how much research you should integrate into your work is quite a, a difficult question. Um, and it's an ongoing challenge. I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to this. I think there are two different approaches to research. And one, which one you choose, choose largely depends on your project and the needs of your project. Um, either you write down the story in a, in a rough draft initially, and then you decide, oh, well, I don't know this and I don't know that and so on, and you fill those in later. Or you sort of research as you go along, which has advantages, but it sort of breaks the flow often of your writing. Or you can research as much as you need to begin and keep copious notes, which means you've got to be a good and well-organized writer, um, keeping good index cards and so on, um, and then begin to write. So if I may speak from experience as I spent several years um, in before I got into well when I first started in the film industry doing research work and that required a tremendous amount of on the ground going out and speaking to people and hearing their stories and so on 
And I found that, I just found that so fascinating. The stories were so brilliant and so interesting. And I found that I'd waste my time sitting over a dinner table and keeping people enthralled with these fabulous tales of these amazing stories and people are in. So, and then you sort of talk your book out of yourself or you, you know, you, once you sat down and done so much research and spoken so much, your book can just sort of disappear, strangely sort of evaporates because a lot of the excitement has gone out of it. So you can research too much. You can get too bogged down in the research. So I mean, these are just ideas I'm throwing out. I don't have an answer for your question necessarily, but it's something to think about what kind of book you're writing. Do you really need to do all that research or could you start and get your story into place and then worry about your research? Um, then your second question, I don't know if, Joanne, do you think we should do the second question as well? Uh, it might be relevant to other people because it's actually about writing practice. Yes, yes. Whether, yes, yes. I think that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. So the second part of Gianthi's question is writing regularly and writing productively towards a goal. I'm very regular about my morning pages and I follow it as recommended by Cameron. I presume this is yeah. the writer's journey, yeah. yeah. And I let the writing happen with whatever comes to mind. And sometimes what comes are things I want to write about for my writing project, but more often it is not. I've been thinking maybe I ought to make prompts for myself to use during that morning writing time or perhaps I need to leave it for how it's intended, as it feels sacred somehow, as it helps me to have a good day, and set up another time for more intentional writing. Any recommendations for finding ways to set up a purposeful writing routine? I think that um, Joanne and I have noticed that this is a question that seems to have come up from quite a few of you. So maybe Jan can also jump in here with her yeah. thoughts. Yeah. But I do think that um, I would say, do not use your morning pages for your project. I think morning pages are a different function of writing. It's a way of freeing up your right side of your brain, which is your creative brain, and letting it just flow without having this continual feeling that you must be producing something or making something. It's a very free place to be. And it's almost like if you're exercising and you warm up your body first before you start running, um, that is what the morning pages function is. So if you start to try and stress about making sense out of your morning pages, it sort of defeats the whole object of them. Um, I don't know if you'd agree with that, Joanne. I completely agree with that. I think it, uh, yeah, I th and and I think it also, as you say, um, you know, it sort of fritters away, uh, rather like you were talking about when you talk about your project too much, it evaporates. If you if you scribble about it too much in morning pages it fritters it away a little bit as well. I mean, po possibly while you are not intending to, ideas come to you, certainly, for your project. And let them come and then ta take them out of that when you have your proper writing time. But I would set a different writing time for your disciplined project writing. And set that time and ring fence it. Don't do anything else. Don't allow anything else to intrude. Lie to people. Um, you know, have a little space where you won't be disturbed. And just, and then uh, don't allow yourself to get up, except perhaps, that's what I do anyway, except perhaps to make a cup of tea. Because after a while, you, you, you know, you feel so bad about wasting your writing time that you just start writing. So um, your writing time is your writing time. Whether you're not writing anything um, or, or whether you are, you sit and stare at that screen. 
um, because that's your writing time. But that's different, as you say, from, from, your, from your morning pages time. Yeah, so, as Freddie. Yeah. I also think if you have trouble getting down to it, which is what a lot of people do, they procrastinate and oh, suddenly you've got to, you know, mow the lawn and you've got to vacuum and oh, you've got to sort out that bookcase that's critical and you find all sorts of reasons to yeah. stop the right side of your brain from working because it's, it's, there's it's a curious, yeah, there's some sort of curious thing that goes on between your right and your left brain. And you've got to almost find little tricks to switch on your right side of your brain because your left side of the brain is always trying to think of things like why you shouldn't write. Why am I wasting my time? I should be washing those windows. I should be doing something with my plants. I should be getting a proper job. You know, there are a thousand reasons why your rational brain is telling your irrational brain not to work. So you almost have to trick it. So there's little tricks you can do. Like Joanne said, routine is the, is the great trick because it's a little bit like anything. Like if you're used to getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth, then you just automatically get up. You don't think about getting up and brushing your teeth. That's the first thing you do every morning. You just kind of do it. And writing is the same. You have to trick yourself into this routine. So if, for example, you take a clock or your cell phone and you set it for five minutes and you sit down and you just write anything for five minutes, then an alarm goes off. And you go, okay, well, I'll set it for another five minutes. And then you set it for 10 minutes and so on. You, if you get into the routine of sitting down at the same place, at the same time, every day, doing the same things, eventually you'll just switch on your computer, or pick up your pen, and you'll just start doing it because that's what you do every day at that time. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of trick, you've got to trick yourself. It doesn't mean you're going to write perfect sentences. It doesn't mean you're going to write a masterpiece. But what it does mean is you'll start the process. And writing is not about writing masterpieces. A masterpiece will come eventually, but it's a lot of work. And the most important thing is you've got to break that log jam, which is procrastination. Yeah. And um, I totally agree. And I also have little tricks um, that I have superstitions. I like to have a certain pen next to me and I like to wear certain earrings and I like to wear certain pants. <laughs> and when I do those things, I'm in writing mode. Um, and they feel to me magical that I can't write without them. But actually, I think it's that way, as you say, of tricking my brain into, uh, you know, into thinking, okay, it's time, it's time to write now. And also reading over what you've, um, what you've, I would often find that if I just read over the last bit of what I wrote previously, it sort of got me back into it. And then even if you write ploddingly at first, you have to stick at it. Yes, Frankie, I saw your comment. So you said, you're saying the same thing. You think I'll write when I've done this or when I've done that and the day is gone. You can't do it. You have to set a time, ring fence it and stick to it, even if you sit ploddingly or staringly. That's, yeah, I would say. <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. I think we can move on to the next one now. And the next one is an interesting one. And it led me into um, different areas of this. It was from Carol. It's close to my heart, actually. She said, have the rules of grammar eased up for creative writing? I've noticed full sentences seem not to be essential anymore. Well, I would say, and I'm always saying in our mentoring, as a general rule, use full sentences. In isolation, there's nothing wrong with the odd sentence fragment. For example, she wouldn't be needing them again, full stop, not after this. An incomplete sentence, it brings us up short and it can add emphasis. And in other words, it has an effect. It's, it produces an effect in your reader. But it, so, Use it all the time and it loses that effect. It's like a, a cry or a scream. 
it gets your attention the first time, but the fifth time you hear that person screaming, you probably won't even look up, you'll be irritated. So for example, when it becomes a tick, when every other sentence is a sentence fragment, it no longer has the effect that you want it to have and it starts, and so first of all, you lose a tool. And also I think it does really start to irritate the reader. So I, I created a slightly extreme example here. So Peter stood between his sisters, waiting to be congratulated by people who could still feel joy. Unlike him, who would never be happy again, he looked over the gathered crowd, didn't see anyone, except Joan, talking to mom's yoga instructor. Now I'm sure that started to, I mean, I did read it rather haltingly, but I had to show you where the full stops were. But that does irritate even when you're reading it and you, you're losing yourself a very useful tool. But I, I, I thought it's nice just to talk a little bit about sentences generally because it is a bit of a bugbear and it does come up quite a lot in our mentoring program and it's something that we talk about a lot. So it's useful to go into. So in the heat of getting the story down, some writers and would-be writers forget that every sentence is sacred. Sentences create a rhythm to your writing. They give it a musicality. The way you write, the way you order your sentences prevents monotony and it creates a pace which adds to the meaning of what you're trying to get across to the reader. So for example, if somebody is shocked, give us short, sharp sentences. Otherwise, a long, mellifluous flowing sentence isn't going to give us the effect of that shock. If a car bomb goes off, don't write, she felt the boom reverberate against her eardrums as the car burst into flame, causing scraps of metal to fly through the air and she rubbed her arm as she felt the sting of the shrapnel hitting her. At that point, we've lost all the drama. We've lost the shrapnel, we've lost the scraps of metal flying through the air. Um, you know, we've, uh, uh, because it's all in that one, it takes such an effort to read through that long, long, long sentence that we've, we've lost half the drama. So break it up, be aware of where the drama lies and give something dramatic its own sentence. While I was thinking about sentences, I found a, a Spectator article which said that um, a fluent, attractive writing style depends on shaping every sentence with care. They said sentences are everyday functional things, ubiquitous and unappreciated. And it's time, the writer argued, that we, that we really started noticing them. Even when we use sentences to carry our most creative ideas, we often use them without thought or an alertness to their construction. So for example, um, I'm always yelling about this and those of you who are in mentoring will recognize and giggle to yourselves, but I'm always shouting about um, an addiction to subordinate clauses. So, I mean, I'm not saying that we should entirely confine ourselves only to simple sentences, obviously. But if you slap everything into the same sentence, you lose so much. So, for example, as if he knew, and this was something I took out of somebody's mentoring, but I've changed it so they won't recognize it. As if he knew, he reached a hand up to her hair and stroked it and her stomach did a somersault, but it was too reminiscent of John's gesture the, the night before and she shook him off. We lose half of what's happening there emotionally because we're still thinking of he's reaching up her hair, but she's thinking about John last night. And, you know, if that were just broken up, we would get far more effect from it. 
Um, and I've, I mean, I'm going to give you another couple of examples because I think it's worth it. Because these are things that we pick out all the time. Then came the sickening sensation as the bus somersaulted before coming to a shuddering halt as it crashed onto the tarmac. Now, what's important here is not the sickening sensation, but that sentence leads with a sickening sensation. It hits you in the face with a sickening sensation, and the bus somersaulting is an afterthought. Now, that's the wrong way around. So give the bus its own sentence. And here's another one that does the same thing. He was filled with a terrifying adrenaline rush as the aisle became a seething, screaming mass of people. Now that's the, the effect before the cause. Give us the cause first in its own sentence. And I mean, while we're about it, a seething, screaming mass could be improved because that's rather general. If you break it down into its specifics, it will be even stronger. So give it two sentences, giving us the specifics of the seething, screaming mass of people in the aisle, and then give us the terrifying adrenaline rush. Um, and I also, yeah, here's another one I came across recently. The force of the sudden jolt that followed flung Julian out of his seat. So now here we lose the effect of Julian being, being flung out of his seat because that funny phrase that followed, it's slightly confusing there in the, minute, in the middle and it isn't really necessary. We can leave it out. The force of the jolt flung Julian out of his seat. And, but you know, you could probably make that more dramatic and stronger if you're allowed to experience the jolt and then give Julian his own, his own sentence. And then I'm just, while we're on the subject of language, so bear with me. So that's what I'm gonna say about sentences. But, you know, language is important. And if you're a writer, you care about language, you care about sentences, and you care about words. So at a deeper level, pay attention to the words you use particularly the verbs. Have you used the strongest verb that you can find? Now by strongest, people sometimes ask, what do you mean strong? And usually it means the, more, the most specific. In other words, have you said they fought instead of perhaps punched, pummeled, gouged, scratched? They're more specific and therefore they, they pack more punch, excuse me for that. Or have you opted for a was or is rather than a more active verb? For example, the screeching sound of steel on steel was deafening. This was a sentence I found in someone's. Isn't the effect instantly strengthened if you wrote steel shrieked on steel? It deafened him. So again, I, I broke the sentences, but actually the, 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 the verb is stronger and therefore the effect is, is that much stronger. And don't forget, there are hundreds of ways you can walk in English. So don't walk. I mean, if they cross the room, they, you know, you, you often don't have to take us every step. You don't have to tell us they walked across the room. If you are telling us they walked across the room, how are they walking? Are they sloping, sliding, striding, slouching? Um, you know, each of those shows us a little something about the character. And then Richard and I have a bugbear that this you mentoring people will also laugh about. Plonk and grab. We find plonk and grab in every thing we look at sometimes. And I don't know why it is, it's become like a, a habit and we all do it. We grab our keys, we grab our girlfriends, we grab our drinks, we grab our, um, you know, everything. And I think it's just a matter of, it's become a little bit of habit in our brain and we have to just unlearn that and try, um, you know, try to think of the more specific verb for 
what you're doing with your drink or your girlfriend or your handbag. Okay, so I mean, that's basically just to say that writing does require attention at every level if you're going to, if it's going to be the best it can be. And it might not be in your first draft. Um, you know, if you, but we, but train your eyes so that when you read your first draft, you think, oh my goodness, I've used grab three times on this page. I'm going to find better verbs. Okay, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> um, I, we have another question here. It's from someone called Ronell. Um, and Ronell says, I think for me, the question is where, how do I start? I'm struggling to write in my work environment and have this desire to explore writing about my sciency work in a popular manner, but also tell my stories. And I'm struggling to find my voice and just write. Well, Renelle, I thought about your question quite a lot because I was intrigued. We don't often get questions about sciency stories, and I was quite intrigued by that. Um, and I thought, well, if you wanted to explain something about science to somebody, how would you go about doing it? And I'm a bit of a dunce having had this kind of in liberal arts education. So I know very little about sciences and I find them very intimidating. But I often read articles in the New Scientist or the Eon magazine. And when I read the news, I always go to the BBC science page. And I like it as a subject of fiction. I was very riveted by Ian McEwan's book Saturday, which is all about a brain surgeon. It kind of takes you into the life of a brain surgeon, which one would imagine um, could be very dry. But in fact, it was incredibly fascinating. And it was really, he is a brilliant writer, but it was also because you entered into the life of being a brain surgeon. You understood what it felt like to stand at a table and open someone's head and look at their brain and know that every part of that would even the smallest alteration of that, that particular organ would actually have massive ramifications for, for, for the patient. So it was incredibly dramatic. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that I really encourage you to explore the sciencey stuff, as you put it, because I think if you're writing from your own experience, people will be very interested in it. And you said, how do I begin? What can I do? How can I begin this? How can I bring the personal and my sci interest in science together? And I thought maybe as an exercise, you could just begin without putting huge pressure on yourself that you're going to write this great book, which is about your experience as a scientist and so on. But maybe write a series of short emails, like every day, maybe write a short email to some imaginary friend someone who knows very little about science perhaps, and these chatty informal letters, you can maybe just talk to them about what you're doing at work and you would take the pressure off by not making it some, a something, but rather a series of friendly communications. Um, I think if you write from your own experience, it will be very fascinating for the average reader. And if you personally find it exciting, um, and fascinating, then we will as well. So I just, that was all I could tell you, not having been, not being a, a science writer myself and it being a bit far out of my reach. But I think if you write from your experience and the enthusiasm that you have for your subject, it, people will like it. They will be interested in it. Mm. Yeah. I think so. Make it understandable and sometimes tell us the stories, if there are stories that go into it or that lead from it. Okay, um, shall we uh, go on to Kelly's, Mish? And Kelly Forrest, yes. Yeah. Okay, so she said, when is it useful to use dialogue or is it better to report a conversation? So we thought it might be fun since we've got me and Mish here um, that I'll say a few little things about writing dialogue in a book 
And although that is also Mesh's skill, she has the screenwriting skills. So we thought um, that she'll talk about the perhaps similarities or differences for writing for the screen. Okay, so shall I launch in and then I'll throw it over to you? Yes, do. Sure. Okay, so just a few little things to say. I would say, when you, if you are, have a character reporting on a logistical thing, um, like describing how to unblock a drain in great detail, um, or you know something mechanical. It's often better to start with a scrap of dialogue which gives us a, a sort of term or two that sounds real and then give us the, the rest in, um, in reported speech because we don't necessarily need a great huge chunk of dialogue trying to explain something that's quite technical or logistical. And equally, if somebody is telling someone else something that we saw happen, in other words, it's repeating something that we know, then report it. She told, you know, she gave the whole rundown of what had happened with him. If it's a dramatic conversation, use dialogue. And, um, you know, that, and that's the main trick. The, the dialogue will, will give us that drama. But also something I've come across sometimes is that someone will have a character begin to tell a, tell a story, say to his children, and then he'll tell them the whole entire story in dialogue. Now, rather have him start telling the story in dialogue, break off and go into the scene so that we see that story for ourselves. And then you can come back into dialogue at the end, you know, or scene or several scenes probably, if it tells a whole story, and then come back into dialogue at, at the end to show that he finishes telling his children that story. But to tell that whole long story in dialogue is, is tedious. It doesn't work. Pitfalls you asked for, well, very quickly, dialogue must sound like, like speech, but without the circularity and the repetition of that make real speech sometimes boring and don't use dialogue to explain stuff to the reader in other words don't let um, your one character say something to the other character that they both know that they would not naturally use uh, that they would uh, that they would not naturally say to that character because that because it's something that character already knows Okay, so that's all I'll say on the subject. Um, yeah, Mish, do you want to? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, this is quite an interesting conversation because dialogue is, I would, you know, dialogue is not speech. It's not what, it's not the way people speak to each other. If you look at dialogue, it's quite interesting if you look at movie dialogue. And whenever I have to write a piece of dialogue in a script, what I'll usually do is I'll write it. So I'll write exactly what I want you to convey. So it might be very on the nose, like, John, you know, I dislike you intensely and I wish you wouldn't drive like that. Then I'll look at it because this is what I want to convey, but I know that that is not the way that I can convey it because it's boring and stupid. And on the screen, everyone can see the way that that character is driving and that they're driving badly and can see the reaction of the other actor. So obliquely, that conversation then becomes about a, a kind of a power struggle between the two characters who are in the car. And so when I then look at the dialogue, I know, that, so I'll rough it out like that, but then when I come back to it, I'll be very oblique about it. I won't talk necessarily even about the driving. You know, I might just say something like, it's a 40 kilometer an hour speed limit here, you know? So in the sense that with all dialogue is not telling you a story, it's not relaying in a sequence, a narrative that is informing the reader about what is going on. So you won't have people exchanging information in dialogue. Dialogue 
in a way, I mean, what is so interesting about dialogue is it's actually about power. So often, for example, you'll get two characters. And as we know, all writing and all narrative writing, and especially in film, is about conflict. Every scene, when we design a scene in a movie, the first thing we say to each other, if we're sitting in a group as writers, is what is at stake in the scene? In other words, what is the conflict in the scene? And what is the stakes for the, for the individuals who are sitting in the scene? So that will determine the way they talk to each other. And often dialogue is a form of code. It's not really the way people speak to each other in normal life. It's a code. And that code is about who has the power in that situation at that moment. And it's an attack and it's a kind of counterattack, even though it might not look like that. So I don't know if any of you watched um, the presidential debate last night between President Trump and Joe Biden, because that was a, it was a complete chaotic nightmare. And the, one could think, okay, one could switch on the television and think, I'm going to hear about, I'm going to hear about politics. I'm going to hear about which candidate I want to vote for. But in reality, what you're watching was a power display. It was a, it was a, a couple of sort of male gorillas coming up against each other and sort of trying to punch each other's lights out. And the language was almost besides the point. It was all in the body language, it was all in the tone, it was all in the coded subtext and so on. And that is really what dialogue is. It's a, it's a complex means with which to sort of psychologically unpick your characters. It's not a way of telling a narrative. That will come in film, it comes through what you see, and obviously in novels, it comes through the internal life of the character often and the action that is going on around the dialogue. As Joanne says, if you want to relay information in a, in a novel, you do not do it through having your characters telling each other what's going on. Um, I think that it, it, there's an art to it. I mean, there's a writer, I, I write crime novels and there's a writer called Elmore Leonard who I'm sure you're quite familiar with, and he's been hugely, hugely, hugely influential on crime writing, not always to good effect, I must say, but his books are nearly all dialogue. And you don't, you, there's very, very little narrative writing or explanation. It's just people, it's just characters chatting to each other. But you learn the most important thing about the characters from reading his dialogue, which is what motivates them what are they feeling in the scene? And what are they trying to get out of the situation? Um, so I think if I had to say anything about dialogue, I'd say, you know, whether you reading Jane Austen or which is all, all her dialogue is about power. You know, it's about a conflict. Um, or you're reading about, uh, you're reading a crime writer who's writing these short punchy sentences as, as Jane, um, as we pointed out earlier. I think that always when you look at a piece of dialogue, when you write a piece of dialogue, it's quite useful to say to yourself, what are the stakes in the scene? What is at stake here for each character? Yeah, great. Okay, thanks, Mish. I thought that was brilliant. Um, I'm going to, I, we've got one more question that came in, and I don't think we will get to um, Kami's earlier question um, this time, but she can send it in for next time. Um, but because we, we had one more question sent in, and I thought I'll say what her question is, and then because the answer is, again, a not no one size fits all, I'll quickly tell you my experience and Mish can tell you her experience. So her question, it's Frances, and her question is, do you think one should write without editing first, then only do editing? Um, okay, so my, my, I'm somewhere in between, I suppose. There, there is no one size fits all. Some people write very slowly, paying attention to every sentence. Some people just, fly through it and then come back and do an awful lot in the rewrite. I suppose I'm somewhere in the middle. The right word is important to me. So I will stop to find the right word because 
that's to me incredibly important. It's the words that put the meaning across. The sound of sentences is important to me. I can kind of hear them in my head. I don't always get it right, and then I'll try to in the rewrite. But I do like to immerse myself in the moment um, and kind of daydream it. Hear my character speaking and to try and kind of let it flow onto the page. And as I said earlier, before I write each day, I, I read what I wrote the, the day before. I read over it quickly, make small changes that just jump out at me, but not to do a major edit, but really just to get me into the new day's writing. But it does allow me to make a few small changes or, or delete a couple of things. And then, but then I move on. And then I do do a huge rewrite. My second draft is massive. That's where my real writing happens. I, I read it all through and then I decide it's a mess and the beginning needs to be redone and I'll possibly restructure and I'll, you know, I do all sorts of things. I rewrite scenes. I, I you know, put more into the characters earlier on. I do a lot of things in my first rewrite. Others follow, but that's, that's my biggest one. Mish? Yes, I think I, I'm quite a chaotic um, writer. So um, I will write, generally, I will start off with a series of notes, like a lot of notes on each chapter. And then I'll start to flesh in those notes and it will be very rough. That first initial draft will actually be almost incomprehensible to anyone but me because it's full of little bits of notes and it's bit, bits and pieces of dialogue. And then the scene sort of mapped out very loosely and all the chapters in this case, if it's a book, uh, mapped out very, very sparsely. And then I tend to dawdle around in the, in the, in the chapters that I'm very interested in. So I, I might get very immersed in one particular chapter and, and really enjoy writing it. And then that will be quite fleshed out. And then there'll be a chapter that will be sort of very, very sparse indeed. And then once I've got that into a sort of form, some sort of rough form with a beginning, middle and an end, then like Joanne said, the most work takes past, past, um, happens in the second draft. So you have this sort of mishmash of things and which has got just kind of a lot of, a lot of what you want to say mapped out. And then you put it away for a while and then you go back to it. And it's then that I find I start to work in a lot of detail into, into each chapter. And then I'll probably go through the whole book like that again. And then I'll start at the beginning again and try and the, I think writing for me takes place in the rewriting. Yeah. The sort of initial writing down is usually terrible writing and, and very bad and all over the place. And the, the real writing happens when you are, I mean, you could call it editing, but I don't know if I'd call it editing so much as that because you're reforming it and you're looking, mm -hmm. as Joanne says, you're looking for the right word, just the right word. You're looking for your sentence construction. You're looking at the rhythm. You, you're starting to foreshadow earlier on in the chapters what happens later. You start to seed ideas earlier. You start moving chapters around. You might even put chapter seven where chapter three was or, and you start trying to adjust your structure. So I think it's a messy process for me, a very messy, but I, li I, I like the messiness of it. I like the, the chaos of it and I like the, the um, uncertainty of, of it. Because I know in my head, I know what I want to write, but obviously what go, what's going on in your head and what ends up on the page are thousands of miles apart initially. Yeah. Um, you, you, I, I, think, I, I think that it was um, Flaubert who said something like, you know, you're beating a, 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 bla a beat on a black kettle when you're hoping that, that the, the stars will sing. It's that, I think that's the quote, because you're basically just hammering 
a, a lot of really bad writing into some sort of shape and then you trying desperately to kind of craft it so that it reaches some the thing that you were hoping and imagining it was going to be months before <laughs> um yeah that's yeah. what I have to say about editing. And then if you're very fortunate, you may have a friend who's got a keen eye and will look over your manuscript for you and, and tell you, oh, well, that's absolutely ghastly and that doesn't work and um, go back to the drawing board on that and so on. And, and um, you've just got to go home and cry for a couple of weeks and then, you know, put on your writing clothes, as Joanne says, your funny pants, whatever, and just get back into your seat and uh, try and haul it back into some sort of shape. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I think we've got through all the sent, all the, um, the questions that we were sent and we have gone a little bit over time, but if, um, if you still had a question and um, uh, uh, that we didn't get to or that you want to ask, please send it in. You know, we do this once a month, so there's always time to, to ask your questions. Um, there's never time, funnily enough, to get through everything. But um, yeah, it's always a joy. It's always great to see you all. It's lovely that you joined us. Thank you, as usual, and um, yeah. Go forth and write. <laughs> yes, nice to speak to you, everybody, and hope to speak to you again soon. Okay, good night. <laughs>